Sunday. Now next Sunday we're going to gather back in here um, using our, our protocols. Um, come on in and join us if, if you're willing to. Other, we will be going Facebook Live at the same time and we will start at 10 o'clock. So pay attention to that. We're going to start at 10 o'clock while we're in this transition time. We're not going to have Sunday school or Wednesday night services here yet, but we are going to be meeting here Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Come a little early so we can get you seated and so we can get started on time. Um, but yeah, look, I look forward to that. Uh, one more announcement. Um, our precious brother Howard Wilson has received a call to First Baptist Church, Vanceburg, Kentucky. And so uh, he's been there as an interim since they've been without a pastor for a few months now. And they have called him as their pastor. And we will miss him and Mary Jo so deeply. But we are so enthused with what God's going to do through Brother Howard at First Baptist Vanceburg uh, once more. He's been their pastor previously. For many many years and they're excited about the opportunity to move there and worship with their friends and family there again so we we send all our grace and love and thoughts that way and we're excited for a sister church we're not in competition we will miss them dearly but we're excited for a sister church well if you got your bibles turn with me to james chapter one today and we're going to look at just a few verses there um in james chapter one and you know i think it's a little bit apropos to what's going on today in our world we have a, a mixture of things that we're dealing with with the isolation and and the possibility of covid i've read a little bit online that some are saying that the uh the covid is kind of rising again now that people are getting back out and, and states are opening back up and, and different shops are opening back up so be careful as you go out it's still not worth getting uh, some people say it's no worse than just a bad case of the flu and those people will be extremely fortunate. Some people have had it. They got the antibodies and they never had any symptoms. They, they're extremely blessed in that. But this virus does take lives. And, it, and, it's, and it's, it's become unpredictable about who will succumb to this virus. So be careful out there. Practice social distancing and take care of yourself. You're your best health advocate and, and never forget that. Well, this morning, let me read just a couple verses here. And then we're going to look at this. And, and, and James is... James writes his book to Jewish believers. They were, they were, they were, they were grown-up Jewish. They were in the Judaism um, religion and practicing all that. And then they found Christ. Christ found them, let's put it correctly. And, and so they're believers, but they had been kicked out of their homes. They had been moved around. And so he's writing to the Jewish believers that were scattered. Now, this book is written really, really early, uh, probably in sometime in, in, the, in the early to mid-40s because... James was the, one of the chief elders at their church at Jerusalem, and he was presiding at the very first church council, and they discussed um, Gentiles and, and them becoming Christians and, and what all was required of them. And we read about that, in, I think, in Acts chapter 15. And James doesn't mention that at all in his book. So it kind of gives us a, a thought that maybe this book was written prior to that, and we know the dating of that. So this is one of the very first books of the New Testament. And James is writing to a group of people who are really distressed. They have lost a lot of their possessions. They've lost their homes. They've been scattered. They were, they were not respected. Things weren't going their way. Does that sound familiar? Well, you, you hear a lot of people talking about things not going their way or not according to their plan. So, so with that in mind, let's get into James. The, the Bible says, this letter is from James. Now, this James, I believe, to be the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus. And so that's another important fact because we see in the New Testament that he didn't really receive his brother at face value. He thought he was crazy at one point. They thought he was beside himself. And, 
But later we see that James becomes a believer, and he actually quotes some things that are very close to some of the things that Jesus said, which is, which is phenomenal. It just goes to show you that, that God reaches even to those whose minds may be made up. God has a way of breaking through the darkness to bring his light. And I think we can see James, the half-brother of Jesus, was a receiver of the light of Christ, and then a faithful follower and servant, and one of the early martyrs of the church. And so he says, this letter is from James, a slave of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad, greetings. And, and that's where we get the word dispersion, the, the word diaspora there. He says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance or your patience has a time to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect, complete, needing nothing. And if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with a divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave on the sea and is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you this morning. Father, we are the church. We are the body of Christ, Father. And, and even though we might not be in one another's very presence this morning, we are together in spirit. We're, we're unified under the banner of Christ. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He gives us all that we need. He sustains us. He brings us along, Father. He, he sends trials into our lives so that we can grow and mature as, as we should in Christ. And so we pray you'll be with us today, Lord. Help us to learn. Open up our hearts that we can receive your truth this morning. Father, I pray you'll give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And Father, I pray that you would pour me out as a drink offering this morning so that everything that I say would be according to your will and your way and your word. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So considering this, um, I, I wanted to title this, God has the answers during trials. God has the answers during trials. And I, I love the way it starts. There's dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way. Well, troubles are one of the things that, that we like to avoid, but it's a constant in everybody's life. I, I don't care if you're a pastor, if you're a dentist, if you're a bank teller, if you mop floors, if you dig ditches, or you run plumbing, wh whatever you do in life, troubles or trials are going to come your way. And so, so the Bible's kind of saying to, to Christians, because a lot of times people think that when, when I get saved, it's just going to be a cakewalk. I don't know where that comes from because it's sure it's scriptural. But a lot of people just can't, they just cannot handle troubles and trials. And I've met a lot of people who call themselves atheists or, or they don't believe in God. And one of the reasons why is because they, they struggle with how can bad things happen to God's people. If God is loving and God is kind, how is it that we have bad things in our life? Well, that's, that's a hard question. That's a hard one to answer because we, we teach that God is all-powerful and he's all-knowing and he can do anything he wants to do. And then we wonder, why doesn't he do something more for me? That's a very good question. And, and the message this morning is God has the answers when we have those questions. God's not afraid of questions. And, and to question God, to question his existence is one thing, but to question why he's doing something... It begins with the faith that he's actually there. And I've met a lot of people who call themselves atheists, but when you get to talking to them, they're actually just mad at God. A lot of people are agnostic, uh, which means they, they, they just can't know if there's a God or not, because the evidence that they look at speaks to them in such a way that they, they can't believe that there, act, there actually is a good God that's out there that's caring for us or watching over us. And so James is writing to this. He's writing to a group of people who, who are struggling with this very thing. And so... In this letter, that this epistle that James wrote, he, he didn't start off with a big, long greeting. He didn't start off with all this flowery speech and then ease into his point. Right off the bat, he says, when you find yourself in troubled times, when you find yourself in struggles, and when you find yourself being, being tried, being tested, count it all joy. Well, that's a hard one, isn't it? When, 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 when bad things are, are going on, we should count it all joy. Well, he's not teaching us that when bad things are happening, we should be just happy. That's, that's not what he's teaching at all. Uh, what, what he, when he says that, he says, when troubles of any kind, and that word is various, no matter what they are, come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. I like this translation the way it says it, because it's an opportunity for us to, to have the correct perspective. And I, I think we're going to see that perspective, no matter what comes into our life, our perspective or our attitude will affect everything. 
I've heard it told, and I don't know if it's necessarily true or not, because I've heard it told from pastors and preachers, and sometimes they take liberties with the truth and make a good point. But I've heard it said that, you know, when a storm comes or the wind blows, uh, um, a bird of prey, like, say, the eagle, when, when, when it gets rough and there's a big thunder come, big thundercloud coming, that they have the ability to fly over. They can change their attitude, which is the angle, and, and fly above a storm. Where the smaller birds kind of get under bushes and get in trees and, and hunker down and get because they can't get up, they don't have that. They they have to they have to ride it out where the where the eagle because of its attitude can soar above it. And and I like that illustration because a lot of this is perspective. How do you see what's happening in your life? And 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 your attitude coming in is the filter you use to receive anything coming into your life. Uh, and your perspective, if if it's wrong. You, you, you tend to lean towards the negativity of things. But if your perspective is correct and you can see that God is doing something miraculous in your life because we, we have this term we use, it's called sanctification. And that's the process where, where God is working in our life to bring out the very image of his dear son. And, and that's, that's what Christianity works towards. It's, you're not saved and on your way to heaven and so you just sit down on the pew and you're okay. It's a process, and we're in a process of, of being changed and, and being conformed to the image of Christ. And so when we, when we get our mind right, it affects how we react to things, and, and, and it keeps our stress level lowered. It, 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 it keeps our depression level um, at a more manageable place when, when we understand that God's doing something with us. And, and, and one of my favorite writers that I like to read after, and me and a brother in the house share, share a like for this guy. His name is Warren Wiersbe. And he's got a quote that, that actually ties into this James chapter, uh, ver, chapter 1, verse 2. It says, our values determine our evaluations. I like just the way he starts with that. Our values determine our evaluations. When, when we have a, the, the right value system, when we realize that, that God loves us and Christ cares for us, and whatever he allows through his love into our life, we handle it, first of all. He's going to provide what we need to get through this. And when we fall short, we have him to take us that when, when our grip isn't far enough, his grip never ends. And so our values determine our evaluations. When, when bad things happen, if you start getting beat down and beat down and beat down, it's time to start checking your attitude and, and allowing God to work in your life. It's not always fun. But we can take it as a chance, as James says, to consider it an opportunity for joy. And it's about our perspective. If, if we value comfort more than character, the trials will upset us. Think about that. When we value comfort more than character. See, God's working on your character. He's trying to get you to the place where you resemble Christ in all of your actions and in all of your reactions and in your thought process. As a matter of fact, Paul said that we bring every thought captive to Christ. No matter what's going on in our mind, we, we have to bring it captive and bring it back under the lordship and headship of Christ. And we can't have the right perspective if we don't. And, and so we, we can let what we say, let our thoughts run away with us. And we're not supposed to do that. We, we're supposed to capture our thoughts and bring them back. So when we have the right perspective, we're going to have the right approach. If we value the material and the physical more than the spiritual, we will not be able to count it all joy. The loss of possessions, the loss of freedoms, the loss of what everybody's calling constitutional rights today, or the, you know, we can take another approach that bad things are going to happen. Trials are going to come your way. There's going to be tribulations. There's going to be things to deal with in your life. And if you're not ready for that, if you're not expecting that, and here's the thing, the trials don't come when you're prepared for them. They blindside you. You may be going about life and you've got everything planned out and, I, and I've said this several times it's been my observation and, and, and it seems to bear, bear witness today, it's been my observation that, that when we're younger we can't wait to get older when we're 5 we can't wait to be 10, when we're 10 we can't wait to be 15 or 16 16 primarily, get our car, get our wheels, get our freedom we get our car, we have a little bit more freedom and then we realize we've got to get a job so that we can keep our car so we get a job, we know the job's not permanent because it's it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the kind of job that a 16 or 17 year old or 18 year old gets while they're still finishing their education. We go to college. We plan on finishing college and changing that section of our life. We're not going to stay in college for the rest of our life. And, and some, although some people are professional students, they just keep going back, keep going back. I don't have the money for that, but I, but I can understand a professional everyday student. I just love studying myself. But we plan on getting through college, maybe getting an advanced degree, and then we plan on getting a career. 
And, and through, the, through that time, we, we may meet our mate. We, we may meet the person that we plan on spending the rest of our life with. And then we, we have a few children, and, and, and we think, okay, I've got this and I've got that. We, we buy a house. We never plan on l losing it. We may plan on upgrading it. But we have these plans until we get our dream home and our dream job and our dream life. And then something comes along and tragically changes all of that, and we struggle with that. I find that people love change until they get to the place where they're content. And then at that place, any change that comes in, they resist and they fight against. And, and they're not planning on losing their spouse. They're not planning on losing their jobs. They're not planning on losing their retirements. They're not planning. And when these things happen, they don't know what to do. Their early life was all about change. Their latter life is about holding on to these possessions. But see, through this, if you have the right attitude and you can take a chance and look at that, it's not always easy. It takes work. It's an opportunity to cultivate an attitude of joy when bad things happen. So when we receive those, it's an opportunity to say, okay, stop here a moment. This is not my plan. What's God doing here? How is he enriching my life? And, and it's a journey. It's a real journey. And it's troublesome at times. And it's hard but if we'll just see it through, if we'll just trust God and follow him, we're going to see that, that what he's doing is good. And he goes on and says, he says, uh, if we live for the present and forget about the future, the trials make us bitter, not better. All of this has to do with our attitude. Bitterness grows in our life. You know, the, the writer of Hebrews warned the church not to let a root of bitterness get started. Because that root of bitterness in a church will grow into a mighty tree in a congregation. And that bitterness becomes the rain and becomes the reason. It becomes the, there's an atmosphere of bitterness in churches sometimes. There's an atmosphere of bitterness in people that you meet where everything is bad all the time. And those are life choices that are leading that way. Now, most people say, well, this happened to me and that happened to me. And one of the few things I see in people's lives is they can never take the blame. For the decisions they've made. Well if this hadn't happened or that hadn't happened. Instead of when this happened. God did this through me. And when that happened. I was able to learn and to grow. And God changed me. And I, I found a way to count it as all joy. But see it takes effort. It takes work. And I love, I love what, what Warren had to say. But let me read it in its entirety for you. Our values determine our evaluations. If we value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us. If we value material and physical more than spiritual, we will not be able to count it all joy. If we live only for the present and forget about the future, the trials will make us bitter, not better. And I think that's a fitting quote that goes along with verse 2 there of, of what God's doing in our life. Then he goes on and says, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance or your patience has a chance. To grow. When your faith is tested. Peter goes on and says that when your faith is tested because it's, it's more valuable than gold. It's, it's going through the refiner's fire. And, and, and your faith, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. If, if, if you've never had your faith tested, then it, there's a question of what your faith is actually in. If, if all of your life is about comfort and ease and possessions... Then, then, then maybe your faith hasn't been tested on those levels yet. But every single Christian I know has had their faith tested. They, they've come to what's called the dark night of the soul. They've come to the place of despair. They've come to the place of what I, what I call sometimes, and, and I've heard other people refer to it as the doldrums. And the doldrums were back in the days of the mighty sailing ships when they had to rely on the wind to move in the ocean when there was no current. When the wind quit blowing. And it could quit blowing for days. And you were in what's called the doldrums. You just sat still. And you couldn't move. I've met a lot of Christians that are sitting in the doldrums. They, it's like the spirit quit blowing and they quit moving. A lot of times it's because we've sailed into an area that God didn't want us to sail into. And, and he's not going to keep moving us into that area. He's, he's trying to get our attention. And, and the testing of our faith is to get our attention to come back and focus on those things that are weak. Because the testing of our faith perfects our patience, or our endurance. And see, the word endurance means to bear up or the ability to hold on. And that's where a lot of us fail. We, we, we miss the ability to hold on. We can make it. A day. I say it all the time in my life. I can do anything for six months. But I've been in the middle of things that I didn't think I could make it one more day, much less six months. I, I, I feel like I, I just can't hold on. I can't go further. But trusting God, and, and sometimes I fail miserably, but I can look back and I can see where, where God was on his way. That God had my salvation. God had my, 
my, my fix for the situation on its way, but its timing was different than my timing. God's timing is always perfect. And our faith means with, when the wind's not blowing and we're in the doldrums to wait on God. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep trusting. Keep faithing. And you're going to see that God will bring you through it. And that's what grows our endurance. The ability to hang on. And, and it's not just a blind patience. It's, it's a, a, a conviction uh, that we have. It's, it's, a, it's a deliberate determination that grows in us as Christians. And so that's what James is teaching here. When, when you see this thing, when you see it come, consider it as an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. James goes on and says, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect, complete, needing or lacking nothing. You know, when Paul said that, he brings it out so good in his writings. He says, I have found in every situation therewith to be content. When I'm in lack or when I'm in abundance to be, he doesn't see the abundance as now I'm successful. I've got plenty because Paul knew that in the next little bit, he could have nothing again. And it happened to Paul all the time. People could be amen in him while he preached the message of Christ and his crucifixion, his resurrection from the dead. He's the salvation of the world. And then the very next day, the people in the city turn on him and stone him or, or, or whip him or beat him or lock him in chains. Paul knew that no matter what was going on in his life, to have confidence, secure confidence, endurance in Christ because he's always got us. And Paul learned how to be content. How do you learn to be content? You go through times that it's hard to be content. Paul never got the big head. I thought, well, I'm the greatest apostle of all times. Because Paul writes later on, I keep my own body under control, lest I myself become a castaway. Lest, lest I get to the place where God can't use me because of my arrogance or because of my haughtiness or because of my needs. If, if I have a need that God has to meet before I'm willing to serve him, I'll, I, that need will never be met. I'll never get to the place where I can serve him, where I can surrender my life, where I can, where I can dedicate my life to serving him. As long as there's some other little criteria that God's got to meet. But you know, God's met all criteria. He's God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He is God. Well, it goes on and says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God. Now, a lot of times we lift that verse out of context. We just talk about if, if you need wisdom. And I've done that many times in my life. But in context, you can see what's going on here. First of all, there were events that happened. And what are those events? They're trials. Various kinds of trials. These are events that come into our life, and, and they're, not, they're not trials that, that don't come to everybody. Because the, the Bible goes on and says in the New Testament that no matter what you're going through, other Christians around the world are going through it. Nothing is unique to you. The problem is we get so self-centered and so self-focused that we think we're the only one that's ever gone through this. And when people say, and it's a dangerous thing to ever say, I know how you feel because you, you don't have the track record of the journey that they have and, and never say, I know how you feel. But you can sure say, I have experienced something similar. How can I pray for you? Because we all go through things. If you're not going through things, you will be. And that's just a guarantee in life. So we have events, these trials that come into our life. And then, and then we have the reason for that. Why is God doing it? Why is God allowing this or doing this in our life? So that we can grow in the likeness and character of Christ. So that, so that we can resemble him more. It's, it's sanctification. But, but if that's not enough, if, if the understanding that there's going to be trials and the understanding that there is a reason behind it, and that should be a lot, that should be all we need. I should be able to say amen and we'll go home. But at this point, a lot of people, when they get to that point, they know there's a trial. And they may think they know there's a reason, but it still shipwrecks them. It still leaves them. They just struggle and struggle and struggle and fight against what God's doing in their life. James says, well, there's one more thing you can do. You can ask God for wisdom to understand what's going on. Now, the word wisdom means the capacity to understand and function accordingly to the knowledge. Check that out again. The, the capacity to understand and function accordingly to the knowledge. And that's how this is applied here. So, so you have the knowledge that we're going to see trials. And you have the knowledge that God's got a reason. But until we have the wisdom to, to, to take that and then apply it to my life. Say, I'm going through something now. But praise God, he's got a purpose in it. I, I'm dealing with something that's, that's beyond my strength and capability. But praise God, he's got the strength and the resolve and the capability to see me when, when we can't actually live that out. 
James says if you lack that wisdom, you, you just can't put that knowledge and understanding together with the capacity to live accordingly, then go to God and ask for the wisdom. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about this is when we're struggling with world events and things that we're going through, he says if you need wisdom. Another translation says if any of you lack wisdom. Now it's hard to admit that, isn't it? It's hard to, especially for a man, a guy I can't speak for, for the female population at all, but I know as a man, for me to ever say, I don't know, is difficult. Because we like to act like we know everything. And we like to give an answer, even if it's not correct. Uh, people have actually said to me, you've got an answer for everything, whether you know it or not. I, I'll, I'll find something to say instead of saying, well, I don't know, let me look into that. And I've learned to do that in the last years. I don't know, let me look into that. Instead of acting like, well, I've got that knowledge, that's no big deal, learned that in middle school. You know, just... It's a hard thing to admit we don't have wisdom. But if you're struggling with anxiety and, and those struggles of life because of the trials you're going through, because life's not working out like you thought it should, this is a very good time to go ahead and throw this next principle in, which is to ask God for the wisdom to handle it and to live accordingly so that we honor Christ. Listen to what he says. If any of you lack wisdom, ask our generous God. I like that. And he will give it. To you. Well, that's plain and simple. I wish we could just pause right there. If you could just say, I'll just ask God, He's going to give me the answer. But a lot of times, we don't really ask God wanting His answer. So, so there's commitment involved. See, we should be serious about drilling down into God and His purpose. I, 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 I like that. We should be serious about when, when you're going to ask God for wisdom to understand the situation you're going through, be serious about it. Don't just say, well, here's the principles. I see this in place. So I'm just going to ask God for the wisdom. But if you're serious about drilling down into the bedrock of what's going on in your life and God's purposes in your life and how he's constructing a building out of you that he's going to inhabit, he, he's living in and, and he's changing, he's remodeling you from the old Adamic nature into the Christian or the Christ-like nature. And, and, and when you see troubles come in, you're like, okay, I don't understand this. I'm struggling with dealing with this. And I know God's got a reason, but I can't handle it. Then when we go to God for the, for the wisdom to handle it, our purpose needs to be, God, show me why this is happening so that I can live in this. Or at least show me a way to deal with this situation. And that's what James is getting at. This is what he goes on and says. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Not your own capability, not your own strength. A lot of people say, why is this happening to me? I was valedictorian, and every time I graduated, I was president of this, and I was president of that. Everybody's always come to me. for, And, and, and you're kind of like, well, you fell off your own throne, and now you're asking God, why aren't, why aren't I God of my life anymore? That's not a good purpose, to come to him. But when we come to him humbly, and we come to him serious because we want to grow, and we want to change as Christians. Do you want to change as a Christian? Do you want to grow into that Christ-like character. He says, when, when you want to have faith in God alone, do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave on the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. When, we, when we're double-minded about this, when, 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 when we're more offended that our reputation has been harmed, then, then we are wondering what God's doing. We miss the point. When God is not receiving the glory, when, when it's so that you can better your life in this world that the Bible says that Christ came to overcome. And we're overcomers. We're overcomers of the world. If the world doesn't respect me, but my God says, well done, good and faithful servant, I don't care what the world thinks. I want to hear from him. Well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to be a slave. As James started this book, he gave his name and he said he was a slave or a servant. Christ Jesus our Lord. When we are serious, honestly serious about being the best we can be for Christ, when our life is about Him, not about our goals, not about the size of our house or the type of car or the clothes that we wear or whether we've got food in the pantry or not, if God's feeding us by the, by the talent of a raven as He did His prophet in the Old Testament, if, if we're not finding the ability, as Paul said, to be content in that, then we're missing the picture of what God's doing in our life. You have faith in him that he'll see you through, or you don't. And when our results are measured by our own dreams, 
not by his purposes, he's not going to answer that prayer. He says you're unstable. You come to me for answers, but you only want answers that will make you more successful. You come to me for answers. You give me lip service, but your heart is far from me, the Old Testament says. We have to be serious about drilling down into the bedrock of God's purposes in our life. What's his purpose in your life? And I believe that if God, and I believe he does, has purpose for your life, that should be our focus. What's God wanting to do with me? Is he wanting you to, to go to the mission field? To serve somewhere where nobody will ever know your name? Is he wanting you to serve in, in the stock room of a huge store because that's where he's got you and nobody will ever know your name? But there's a co-worker that you're going to be able to be the light for. Or there's this person here or this person there. There was one of the greatest evangelists that ever lived who was won to Christ by a, a guy that bought shoes and witnessed to him. And that shoe salesman began to preach and then, and then one person got saved and that person preaching and then another guy got saved and he came, became one of the greatest evangelists. And if you'll study the history of Billy Graham, you'll see how that works going back through those events. If, if you were that shoe salesman, is that okay with you? If, if you were the person in the stock room that, that, that God never opened the door for you to be the bank president, never opened the door for you to be the well-known politician, God never opened the door for you to be anything other than that. If God desires you to be a janitor, I've been a janitor, and, and, and it's a lowly position. It's a lowly position because people disrespect that position, and it's hard to be in that position where people don't care about you. I remember washing a glass door. I was a, I was a janitor at a Bible college, and I was cleaning a glass door. It was my daily routine. I cleaned that glass door. And one of the other students who didn't have to work on campus, I guess he had everything handed to him, as he walked out the door, looked at me and put his hand on the glass, looking at me, and pushed it open. And, and you couldn't, you couldn't, as far as my field went as a janitor, you couldn't disrespect me more. And as he pushed that door open, I just felt like God said, I can use a humble servant, but I can't use arrogant. And I thought, I'll just wipe that door again. Praise the Lord, he gives me an opportunity to clean that door. That's about the approach to making it joy. Count it all joy, James says. Consider it an opportunity to, to be joyous because God has brought a trial, a test into your life to show you where you need to be humbled under his hand so that he can lead you and guide you by just simply touching at you. It's a wonderful promise he offers. So we have the events that we're all going to see we have the reasoning God's doing something. And if, and if that's not enough for you, then come to him with, with a request for understanding for this, what you're going through. Come to him and say, why is it this way? And then wait upon that answer. Wait upon him. Spend time in his word. Study his prophets, his priests, his kings, his apostles, his disciples, and, and the teachings of Jesus to see what they went through and how they endured and what Christ taught. And then decide in your own life that I want to react like Christ reacts. I want to walk as Christ walked. You talk about unfavorable treatment. When Christ was crucified, when they took an innocent man and did what they did to him, he hadn't earned a thing. If anybody could have cried out, why is it this way? I don't deserve this. He said, they persecuted me. Do you not think they'll persecute you? I hope that you can take this teaching today and this understanding that's in the book of James. And James is about bona fide faith. James is about a faith that works, not a faith that's words. Study the book of James. Let that sink into your life. Let it percolate in your life. Consider who the audience was and what they were going through and what James had to say. One of the greatest things I like to say about James is he was saying, man up. Grow up. Be a Christian in deed, not just name. I pray God blesses you today. I'm Pastor Rusty at Calvary Baptist Church. I look forward to seeing you in service next Sunday. Let's pray. Father God, today in Jesus' most precious name, as we head to a time of invitation, I pray that you would speak to the people that are listening. And while the music plays and while the accompaniment goes along, I pray that you would speak into our heart. And Father, help us to realize what you're saying through the Spirit. 
Father, I've given the, the message that I believe that you've given me, and I pray that you would do what you do with it, and only you can do with it, and we'll glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.